Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of 1 Samuel. We resume our study today in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13. So grab your Bible. If you can, open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 6. We'll begin in just a minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can study the Bible, just as the name suggests, verse by verse. From Genesis through Revelation, using my audio Bible messages, study through the entire Bible three complete times, from Genesis through Revelation. The great thing about this is that you can begin in the beginning and go all the way to the end and go at your own pace and go at your own convenience, or you can study any individual book of the Bible you want to study. Maybe you want to study the book of Psalms or the book of Proverbs to get wisdom, or Psalms to bring comfort, whatever the case might be. It's, it's a smorgasbord of God's Word, the Word of God, God's food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So study the Bible at the Bible verse by verse. Dot com. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, <clears throat> last time we saw that the Israelites, who had been in rebellion against God, lost a battle, lost a couple of big battles against their arch enemies, the Philistines. And uh, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, which, as some of you probably know, was the throne room of God here on earth. They didn't capture God because God wasn't even in that battle because his people were rebelling. But they did capture the ark, and God was not too pleased with that because they set it up in the temple of their false god, their idol, Dagon, as if to say, our God beat your God. Well, God knocked Dagon down in the temple twice, the second time, he cut off his head, cut off his hands. He humiliated Dagon. The Philistines realized, hey, there's something going on here, especially after they started getting sick. And then they knew, they figured anyway, that it was the God of Israel who was plaguing them, and they remembered what that God did to Egypt years earlier. <clears throat> so they decided they're going to get rid of it. And so they put it on a cart, and they sent it going. And it went, and it's coming to Beth Shemesh. So let's pick it up in verse 13. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Well, the return of the ark, if nothing else, suggests an easing of God's wrath toward his people. Remember, he had been angry with them because they rebelled against him. They were living in sin. They were lukewarm at best. And that's why they lost the battle. So the ark, and they lost the ark. So now the ark is back. Maybe there's a glimmer of hope. And that's why they're rejoicing. And you know, that's one thing I really appreciate about God. They probably thought, well, this might indicate an easing of God's wrath. And God's wrath may last for a night, the Bible says. But, weep, but weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning, the Bible says. One thing I like and appreciate about God, his anger does not drag out. And he doesn't hold a grudge. The Bible says his anger is but for a moment. And his favor is for life. So when we repent and we confess, his anger is gone. Just like that. It vanishes. Verse 14. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite, and stood there where there was a great stone. And they clave the wood of the cart and offered the kine or the cow 
a burnt offering unto the Lord. Verse 15. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And so they gave God offerings, notice, on the same day. The same day that that ark returned, they gave God offerings. When God does something to bless you, it is good to respond to him immediately with thanksgiving and whatever else good you feel like doing for him. <clears throat> but don't put it off. Or sure enough, you probably forget it. Verse 16. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. So they kind of stood by in the wings and watched to see what would happen to that cart that was carrying the ark. The Philistines watched until they were satisfied that they had done the correct thing. And they knew they would not have peace of mind until they satisfied God. The Bible says there is no peace for the wicked. Verse 17. And these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. For Ashdod won, for Gaza won, for Ashkelon won, for Gath won, for Ekron won. Verse 18. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Beth Shemite. <clears throat> God struck the fortified cities as well as the unwalled cities with plagues. And that's because there is no defense for God's punishment. There are no defenses for God's punishments. They pursue and they strike, no matter where the sinner may hide. If you want to avoid God's punishment, then it won't happen by building walls around your city. Repentance and confession are the only things that stop his punishment. Verse 19. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented, because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. No one, not even the priests themselves, were supposed to touch the ark. It was holy. They weren't supposed to touch it. They certainly could not look inside. But curiosity got the best of these people. These people had become way too familiar and way too chummy with God. They didn't respect His holiness. They did not respect Him the way they should have. And God struck them dead as a result. Verse 20. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God, and to whom shall he go up from us? So they are talking as if, as if the death of these people was God's fault. God didn't kill them because he is holy. That's what the implication was. Oh, he's so holy, he killed them. No. God killed them because they were bad. God killed them because they took liberties with God. God killed them because they treated him as a profane thing. It's not God's fault that people go to hell. People go to hell because they are bad. God isn't responsible for anybody going to hell. 
oh, his justice ends up sending them there. But they go there because they've been because they've been bad, because they sinned, because they refused to repent, because they refused his mercy. They go to hell themselves of their own volition. That's your choice, man. If that's what you want to do, you just go right ahead. I'm not going to stop you. No one's going to stop you. God's not even going to stop you. If that's what, if that's what you really want, then go for it. 21. And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. The Israelites, the Israelites are tossing the ark around like it was a hot potato as well, just like the Philistines did. It bouncing all over the place. Everywhere it went, there was trouble. There was trouble. Because the people didn't respect God the way they should have. The presence of God is never a problem. The presence of sin in people is the problem. Let's go into chapter 7, verse 1. And it says, And the men of kirjath Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So they consecrate Eliezer in order to qualify him to take care of the ark. In order to do this important job for God, Eliezer has to be holy and he has to be separated from the things of the world that might compromise his morals. It is a very serious thing to be in the ministry. It is a very serious thing to teach the word of God, to be responsible to lead God's people. You better be consecrated. You better be holy. You better not be playing around with sin. Or it will affect your behavior. It will affect your teaching. You better be close to God. Because you will give an account of how you led God's people. And that goes for Bible teachers, pastors, whatever the case may be. Anybody in positions of authority before the Lord is in an awesome responsibility, a very frightful position to be in, if you really think about it. And it, it should drive every one of us who are in positions like that to our knees. And so, look at verse 2. And it came to pass, while the ark abode in kiriath Jerem, that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented before the Lord. The people were sad because God seemed so far away. But, of course, like I said, I believe last time, he didn't go anywhere. They did. God was just a prayer away from any of them if that prayer would include repentance. God is a prayer away from you. You say, well, God seems so far away from me now. I'm just not as close to him as he used to be, as I used to be. Well, he's as close to you as he ever has been. You just can't feel him. You just can't communicate with him. He just can't communicate with you because you haven't repented. He is a prayer away. You are a prayer of repentance away of having things being the way they used to be. Verse 3, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. See, I told you, that's the only reason that they ever lost a battle or ever lost a war, was because they weren't walking with the Lord like they should have been. God's not going to fight for them if they won't stand up for him and stand with him. They turned their back on God. God didn't turn them back on them. That's the same with us today. God never turned his back on you. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
But there's a whole lot of people that turn their back on God. And so anyway, let's read verse 3 again. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all of your heart. That means mean business. God knows if you're trying to kid him. <clears throat> so that's a waste of time. But he says, if you're going to do it with all your heart, then put away the strange gods and the Ashtoreth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. In other words, you talk about how much you respect God. You talk about how much you respect God. Well, if you do, then get serious about God. If you want God's power and you want God's presence and you want God's fellowship in your life and you want God's peace in your life, then get rid of all moral compromise, no matter how strong the temptation is. Love Jesus more than you love temptation. Love Jesus. Love what he delivers in the form of peace and fellowship and comfort and blessing. Love that more than you love the pleasures of sin. And you'll turn away from that rot. And he'll bless you. But the choice is yours. It's always up to you. You say, well, you don't know I, I am an addict. Well, then unaddict yourself. The Bible says overcome evil with good. But one thing is for sure. If you want God's power and presence and fellowship in your life, then get rid of all moral compromise. That's the message here in verse number 3. Now look at verse number 4. Verse 4. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. They serve the Lord only. They serve God only. Only. That's what God demanded. And that's what they and that's what they did. They wanted God, and so they did things God's way. If you want God badly enough, then you will do things God's way. Because you know what? He's not compromising. You have to be reconciled to Him. He's not going to reconcile Himself to you. He's the standard. He does things the right way. What He demands is absolutely right all the time. So if you want God, then you have to submit to him. You come on his terms. God will accept no rivals to first place in our life. If someone is serious about God and they really want a relationship with God and they really want everything that Jesus can provide, I'm talking about forgiveness, redemption, deliverance from hell, fellowship with God. If you really want that, Really? Are you dead serious about it? Then you will turn away from all known sin. This is why those preachers for hire, and that's exactly what they are, popularity mongers and preachers for hire, who and they claim to believe the Bible today, neo-evangelicals, and they say never ever tell a lost sinner to repent. I've talked about that last time. You realize you're condemning souls to hell? Do you realize... By saying that, oh yes, you're popular. And you'll get a lot of people to follow you, I'll bet you. Why not? You don't have to, they don't have to turn away their sin. You, you just tell them a lie that they can be right with God even without repentance. You're not doing them any favors. And I'll tell you something else, you're not doing yourself any favors either. But you can't have what God will deliver through Jesus Christ unless you turn away from all known sins. That's repentance. And that's what Samuel told them to do. And that's what they did. And they will be blessed as a result of that. These jokers who tell you what, what you want to hear to make you comfortable, to make you comfortable in your sin and think that you're still right with God, they're the devil's preachers. They're the devil's ministers, not God's. Measure things by the word of God. And you'll see. So the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtoreth and serve the Lord. What? Only. You got one joker. At, the, uh, at, a, at a very famous Bible college in uh, the Midwest here in the United States. Very, very, very popular, very historic Bible college. 
and they had their annual get-together of preachers and conferences and one very prominent speaker stood up and told the student body that it was important for them to ask Jesus Christ to be their savior immediately. But he went on to say, don't worry about making him your Lord, because after all, most people don't do that till they're at least in their mid-30s anyway. He just gave those people in his own puny, pathetic, ungodly mind a license to sin while promising them salvation through Jesus Christ. And what he did was condemn some of them to hell. Anyone who died in that state went to hell. Anyone who died without asking Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior died and went to hell. What did I say? They serve the Lord only. serious about God, you're going to turn away from all sins. You want God's blessing, you're going to turn away from all sins. Somebody sends you, sells you a cheap shortcut, don't you buy it. If it's too good to be true, you can count on it. It's too good to be true. It's not true. Verse 5. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. The people needed the prayers of their spiritual leader, Samuel. He gave them the truth. He gave them the word of God. Remember, he was used to doing that. From, from his very first message, when he was like maybe 12 or 13 years old, he had to tell his boss, the priest in the tabernacle, Eli, that God has pronounced judgment on you. That was a tough message for a 13-year-old, but he did it. Might as well start out right away preaching the truth, even if it's tough to hear, even if it's unpleasant to say. So he gave the people the truth. Put God first. There's no shortcuts here. You put God first if you want God's blessing. So he gave them the truth. And now they need the prayers of their spiritual leader, Samuel, as well as the truth. They had determined because of the fact that he proclaimed the word of God clearly in a straightforward manner. They determined, okay, we got it. We'll do it. They determined to walk in the will of God, but they needed prayer to strengthen them to do it. Good intentions are great, and you won't have good intentions unless you're getting the truth. You'll be satisfied with bad intentions and lulled to sleep thinking that that's just fine. Good intentions are great, but they need to be backed up with prayer so that you can follow through. Verse 6, And they gathered together to Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. The water they poured out was symbolic of repentance. They didn't eat. They did not eat, and they did not justify any of their sins. They fasted, and they confessed. They fasted, they repented, they confessed, they emptied themselves of self before God. The Bible says, he who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will God exalt. 7. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. The Israelites were afraid of the Philistines. Deuteronomy 1.17 says this, Do not be afraid of any man. But they were afraid of the Philistines. Their fear was directed in the wrong place. The only one you need to fear is God. If you fear God, if you respect God, God will take care of you so you don't even have to think about fearing any man. Israelites have to learn that lesson once again. They forgot it. Verse 8, And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. The Israelites didn't want a simple little prayer from Samuel. They wanted him to do a spiritual filibuster before God on their behalf. They wanted Samuel to plead with God for them. Verse 9, 
You know, sometimes two our fathers just don't cut it. Sometimes we have to labor in prayer. Verse 8, or I should say verse 9. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And the Lord heard him. Because he meant business, and so did they. The burnt offering symbolized the total dedication of the offer to God. That was Samuel, and that was also the people. You know, the people had prayed for a closer walk with God. They prayed for a closer walk with God, and you know what the answer to that prayer was? You know how God delivered that answer? An attack from the Philistines. And Israel had no choice but to draw closer to God. When we pray for a closer walk with God, we should not we should not be surprised if we experience trouble because that sometimes propels a Christian into that closer walk with God. Verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. God knows how to answer our prayers. God knows what will work. He released thunderclaps that were so loud that they threw the Philistines into a panic. They were too shook to fight. So Israel easily defeated them. Verse 11. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Beth Kar. Israel pursued the Philistines from point A to point B. You could have followed their trail because it was laced with dead Philistines all along the way. Verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. The stone was a memorial to God's goodness. It's good to keep track of the things that God has done for us because if we don't we're likely to soon forget just how how much God cares and when we start forgetting that that can lead to sin backsliding indifference 13 so the Philistines were subdued and they came no no more into the coast of Israel and the land of the Lord or I should say the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel Samuel was a godly man who led the people well, and God gave him success because of that. Walking with God doesn't mean there will never be any bad in your life, but it does mean that there will be some spiritual fruit even in the midst of the bad. There will be success even in the midst of sorrow. Verse 14, And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even unto Gath and the coast thereof. Did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines? And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. So Israel took back the territory that the enemy had stolen during the days that they had rebelled against God. And God has not promised any sort of material restoration for repentance today. Don't let anybody tell you that he has. They just want your money. They want to be popular. He has not promised any sort of material restorations if you repent today but he has promised us immediate and full spiritual restoration forgiveness eternal life the moment you repent and confess and that's much more valu valuable than wealth 15 and Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life Samuel did all that his mother dedicated him to God to do 16 and he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places Samuel went to the Samuel went to where the people were he settled their disputes he answered their questions he taught them the Bible he was a servant of God which made him a giver to the people a giver of good things of holy things 
People who walk with the Lord live to give, not to receive. They're not greedy. They're generous. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about attitude. They're unselfish. If you're on fire for Jesus Christ, you're going to be unselfish. You're going to be caring. You're going to be sensitive to the needs of others. Verse 17. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house. And there he judged Israel. And there he built an altar unto the Lord. Samuel always found a way to get home regularly. You know, God recognizes that home is a good thing. Home should be a refuge. It should be a place of support. A place to go. A place to regroup. Out of time. Actually, beyond out of time, but that's okay. I wanted to finish this chapter. You can go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website, found at thebibleversebyverse.com, and continuing, continue to study the Word of God there at your own pace, at your own convenience. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God blesses you, please remember, I've never been underwritten by a large church or denomination, and am not now. I just depend on individuals like you who love God's Word, to want to share in this ministry, to want to help me get out the Word of God and continue to get out the Word of God. And you can do that with your gifts and your prayers. You can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead. Otherwise, you can write the old-fashioned way, Scripture verse by verse, Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. That's scripture, verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. Until next time, this is Michael Moret thanking you for spending this time with me. I do appreciate it. We'll pick it up in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel. So long, everyone.